Good evening. Good evening. Welcome you to this week's midweek Lenten service as we continue to hear from God's word how important it is for us to repent and turn to Jesus. Tonight we're encouraged to do so because he changes lives. We welcome those of you who are also worshiping with us on the internet this evening. We pray that God will bless us all as we worship together. and will join in the responsive litany. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name, forgive our sins, speak to our hearts, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word, and receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our psalm for this evening is Psalm 130. We'll read those verses together. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. We pray. Lord God, grant us your Holy Spirit that we may hear and believe your word. Cleanse our minds and renew our hearts that we may live for you here and hereafter through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Give your attention now to the fourth portion of the Passion reading as it's compiled from the four Gospels. As soon as it was day, the council of the elders of the people met together, both chief priests and experts in the law. They brought Jesus into their Sanhedrin and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer me or release me. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, I am what you are saying. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? For we ourselves have heard it from his own mouth. Then the chief priests with the elders and experts in the law, together with the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Then, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he began to feel regret. He brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? That is your problem. He threw the pieces of silver into the temple and left. Then he went out and hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put these into the treasury since it is blood money. They reached a decision. They met and decided to buy the potter's field with the money as a burial place for foreigners. So that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price the sons of Israel had set for him, and they gave them for the potter's field just as the Lord commanded me. Early in the morning, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. They did not enter the Praetorium themselves, for they would not become ceremonially defiled. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, it's not legal for us to put anyone to death. This happened so that the statement Jesus had spoken indicating what kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, It is as you say. The chief priests accused him of many things. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Pilate questioned him again, Are you not going to answer anything? See how many charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus still did not answer anything, so Pilate was amazed. Then Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. He asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus answered. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate, Pilate asked. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. I was born for this, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? Pilate said to him. After he said this, he went out again to the Jews and told the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they kept insisting, he stirs up the people, teaching all through Judea, beginning from Galilee all the way here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For a long time he had wanted to see him because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see him do some miracle. He questioned him with many words, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the experts in the law stood there vehemently accusing him. Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and ridiculed him. Dressing him in bright clothing, they sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this, they had been enemies with each other. 
This is the end of the fourth portion of the Passion History. But thou, O Lord, have mercy on us. And we join in reading the seasonal response. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We'll continue with the sermon hymn in Christ alone. and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father who graciously sent his Son so that we can stand one day in his power and by his glory in the eternal home of heaven. Word of God for our consideration this evening was recorded by Luke in chapter 7 verses 44 through 50. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, 
Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is God's word. In the name of our dear and loving Savior Jesus, who sacrificed himself to save us from our sins. Can your entire life be changed by three words? Almost seems like that's a little extreme. Three little words and your entire life is going to be different than what it used to be? Well, what if those words are, we're having triplets, I know somebody who had triplets and their life changed just like that. As soon as you find out you're having triplets, you start planning and preparing and start purchasing things that you're going to need. This couple figured in one month they would go through 900 diapers. And then when the triplets were born, their life changed. There was no going out to a movie or dinner if they wanted to or felt like it last minute. The triplets were there and had to be tended to and fed and cared for and their life had changed. Or what if when you were children growing up, your parents came and said, kids, we're moving. Everything that was familiar to you was going to be gone. The friends that you grew up with, the school you attended, the playground that you used to go to in the afternoon, all going to be gone and you'd be in a new and strange place and life would be certainly different, would it? Tonight we're going to hear about three words that will change the life of every person who speaks them. These words aren't going to add triplets to your family or cause you to move and live in some unfamiliar place. These are words that one of the people in the text for tonight spoke freely and another person had difficulty speaking. They are the words, I have sinned. We're going to take a look at the people that were involved in this text from Luke chapter 7 to see just how those words changed the life of the one who spoke them and how desperately Jesus wanted to change the life of the one who had difficulty speaking them. So let's join Jesus at the home of Simon the Pharisee where he had been invited for dinner. In the verses preceding our text, Luke tells us that when Jesus arrived, the host, Simon the Pharisee, did not greet him at the door with the customary kiss of friendship, did not offer him any water for his feet, which would have been dusty from traveling on the roads, didn't really welcome him into his house at all. And this wasn't just a slip up of the host. It wasn't something he just overlooked and didn't realize he had made that mistake. This was intentional on the part of Simon the Pharisee because he didn't see Jesus the way that he should see Jesus. He had invited Jesus to his house, not for a cordial evening and dinner party, but rather to watch him closely and carefully and to see if perhaps there was something that Jesus did or said that he might be able to use against Jesus, this man who was stealing the people from him. And so he invited Jesus over for dinner to keep a close eye on him. Luke tells us that as they reclined at the table, which was their customary way of eating, suddenly another person entered the scene. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now when Simon saw what was happening, he muttered kind of to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Well, Jesus, the divine son of God, knew what Simon was saying, even though he didn't say it loud enough for Jesus to hear. And so Jesus began to tell a story to Simon. He told a story about two people who owed a certain man a debt. 
One owed him a very large debt and one a smaller debt. Neither one could pay the debt and the man that they owed the money to came to them and said, let's just cancel both debts. And then Jesus asked, now which of them will love him more? Well, Simon the Pharisee was an intelligent man and the answer was right there. He couldn't deny what the answer to that question was. He said, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. The groundwork for a very confrontational but oh so necessary conversation had now been laid. Jesus turned to the woman who had washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair and said to Simon, her many sins have been forgiven. She had come to Jesus because she recognized I have sinned. Her actions said to Jesus, I am sorry. And the tears that flowed from her eyes said to Jesus, please forgive me. And immediately Jesus turned to her and said, your sins are forgiven. He being the son of God again knew who this was and he didn't attach any conditions to her forgiveness. He didn't say that if you can do this and lead a more exemplary life for a certain amount of time, I will forgive you. There were no maybes or could be's. There was no long list of things she would have to do to qualify for that forgiveness. The only thing that Jesus needed from her were those three words. I have sinned. Please forgive me. And as soon as those words came to Jesus' ears. He pronounced her forgiveness. Now all of the things that she had done were suddenly his responsibility. All of the guilt that she had incurred from the sordid life that she had lived were now on his shoulders. But that's exactly what he had come to do, to take all of that guilt and take all of the responsibility for her sinful lifestyle on himself so he could turn to her and say, your sins are forgiven. And when he said those words, those words had power in her life and changed her life. This woman recognized the immense debt that she had. I don't think she, as a six or seven year old girl, decided that one day she was going to be a prostitute. I don't think that she planned this sordid life that she had fallen into. But now as she looked back, she saw the road that she had traveled and she was embarrassed by it. She felt remorse in her heart. She felt the guilt over what she had done. And she came to Jesus' feet and admitted, I have sinned. Please forgive me. Immediately, Jesus announced that forgiveness to her and her life changed. No longer a condemned child of Satan on the road to hell because of what she had done, but a forgiven daughter of Jesus on the path to eternal life in heaven because of what he would do. Those three words, I have sinned, changed her life. Well, Simon the Pharisee saw this woman and knew about her lifestyle. It says that she was well known around the town for the things that she did. And he recognized that she had a lot of guilt on her plate, but he didn't see himself that way. Ask the other guests that were at the dinner, who's the better person, her or me? They'll tell you. I'm a good person. I'm an every Sunday churchgoer. I'm a faithful husband. I've raised my children and given them everything they need. I work hard for my employer. I don't claim that I'm perfect, but I'm certainly not as bad as she is. Jesus saw a glaring fault in that man, though. The resume that he presented looked pretty good, but Jesus noticed that that man lacked one thing. He didn't feel the need to say, I have sinned. And so Jesus confronted him with that story. Two people who had their debts forgiven, one who had a large debt forgiven and one who had a small debt forgiven. They both loved the one who forgave the debt, but obviously the one who'd been forgiven more felt a little more. 
But this man didn't know which one of those two he was. He thought he was the one with just a little debt to forgive. But which of the two people in this story do we relate to? I think all of us can see ourselves relating to the woman who came to Jesus knowing just how much we needed him. Because God's law has shown us clearly that it's not the size of the sin that you commit or how often you commit that particular sin or how many sins you commit. When you look at people's hearts with God's eyes, he sees either sinner or saint. It's black or it's white. It's yes or it's no. And regardless of how big or how recurring or how many sins you've committed, God says the soul that sins is the one that will die. And he tells us that not all of the riches of the world can even pay for one of those little sins. So if we, like this woman, recognize that we have an unpayable debt. We gather together on a regular basis and we come to the altar of Jesus and we admit to him, I have sinned, please forgive me. And Jesus changes our life. Jesus says your faith has saved you. That gospel message that the Holy Spirit has used to convince us that no matter what sin it is I've committed, or how often I've committed it, or how many sins I've committed, Jesus' blood washes them all away and gives us the confidence to fall before him and confess freely that we have failed, to weep those tears of sorrow over the sordid lives that we've led, maybe a, a different path of sin than what that woman had lived, but our own path of sin through our life, and Jesus says to us, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has made you clean. But before we walk away from that mirror, let's take another look because I think we'll also see a little bit of Simon the Pharisee staring back at us. Now we will admit with Simon the Pharisee that we're not perfect, but don't we sometimes think that we're at least a little better than other people. When the hymn writer says, chief of sinners though I be, do we argue with him and say, no, 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 that's my position? When we hear Paul in his letter to the Ephesians saying that he is less than the least of God's people, do we say, no, 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 I'm below you? Or do we say, yeah, I never persecuted Christians. I never did some of the things that I've heard others have done. Our sinful human nature doesn't like to admit that our debt is insurmountable. And our egos are soothed when we put ourselves maybe in the middle somewhere. And when we do that, we become Simon the Pharisee. We feel that we're not as bad as other people but we still need Jesus, and we find ourselves kind of a combination of those two. But which really should we be? If God's law says you should not sin, and James says that one sin breaks them all, then we realize we are that terrible sinner that we don't like to think we are. We are that person who God would have no problem proving that he has the right to send to hell forever if that's what he wanted to do. And it's because of our realization that we don't have any way of changing that. There is no possible way for us to remove the, the guilt of even one sin, if that's all we've ever committed, let alone the hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions that we know we've committed. Then we find ourselves standing at Jesus' feet going to him because the gospel has invited us to come and lay our sins at his feet. And we're not embarrassed to say, I have sinned, because we know of his love. We come with boldness and confidence in the promise that he's given to us. If you confess your sins, God will cleanse you and purify you 
and free you from all of the guilt of your sins. And so we come on a regular basis as a congregation before the altar of God and say, I have sinned. Lord, have mercy. Please forgive me. And on an individual basis, each day we should fall on our knees and come to the feet of Jesus and say, I have sinned. Please forgive me. And we do that without fear in our hearts because we already know the answer Jesus will give. Jesus does not change. And just as he pronounced forgiveness to that woman, he pronounces his forgiveness to us. Your sins are forgiven. God doesn't want us to trivialize our sin or to underestimate its power. But by the same token, God doesn't want us to despair in sin either. He wants us to lay it at the foot of the cross. And as we come to the foot of the cross with our sins, we stare in unbelief at the love of Jesus as the blood pours down from that cross, paying for every sin I have ever committed, every sin that every person in the world has ever committed, knowing that he wanted to wash away those sins so that he could look at us and say, you are forgiven. Our lives have been changed by those three words. We now are God's sons and daughters, forgiven, saints on earth, looking forward to being saints in heaven one day. It is because of the love of Jesus that we come to him and give him our sins and live our life now in love. He has said to us, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In the peace of God, we worship and praise him. In the peace of God, we live our life to his glory. And in the peace of God, we will one day be taken from this life to our home in heaven. We're having triplets. Yeah, that'll change your life. Kids, we're moving. That'll be an adjustment. I have sinned. You are forgiven. That really changes your life. We now are God's children who can look forward to living in heaven one day with him because God has forgiven us through his son Jesus. May we always love and cherish that gospel message, the message of the cross, the message of God's love for us and Jesus' love for us and the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us to faith in our Savior. And may that powerful message guide us through the rest of our life as we now live for him to say we are thankful. Amen. And now the peace of God that goes beyond our understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our offerings for the Lord will now be gathered. stand for prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, we come before you this evening to thank and praise you that you have, have invited us to lay our sins at the foot of your cross to have them washed away. 
Through your law, we have recognized the terrible guilt that was our responsibility because of our disobedience to the commands of God. We knew from his word that every sin could be punished with an eternity in hell. But the love of God was shared with us in the gospel and led us to you as the Lamb of God that would take away our sins. We thank and praise you that we can stand before you without fear, confessing, I have sinned, knowing that you will say you are forgiven. Forgive our sins this evening as we lay them at the foot of your cross. Give us that peace of knowing that we are your beloved sons and daughters, and guard and protect us with your Holy Spirit as he works through the word and the sacrament to continue to keep us in faith now and forever. We ask this in the name of our Savior Jesus, and in his name we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Amen. May be seated as we close with the final hymn. Thank you. 